I'm Linda. And I'm Sarah. Are you ready? Oh yeah, I'm ready. Let's get relational. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Let's Get Relational. Um, today we are going to be talking about uh, creating a support network um, for, for yourself. Uh, it's important to have a support network to be able to um, go to people uh, uh, for advice, uh, for um, help, for love and support. Um, and it's basically like creating like an extended family for yourself so that if something comes up, you have other people that you can rely on. Um, some of you may be very uncomfortable with, with that. You know, we want to be really independent, want to do everything ourselves. That's, that's okay. I get that. I've been there. Um, yeah, she gets it. <laughs> um, but the really nice thing is that when you have people that you can also rely on to be able to support you in certain situations, then it's a, life just becomes a whole lot less stressful because it, you're not having to come up with every single little thing that you need to do or to thrive or survive or in any in any context you have other people that you can go to to be like hey i really just need some love right now or like can i talk to you about this or i just want to hug you know that kind of thing sometimes you just want to hug okay um <laughs> we we have a we have a thing every time uh that i come over like if we don't first hug when i first see her it's like then i'll just kind of follow her around at some point and be like mother i require a hug embrace me <laughs> she does literally do that mm -hmm. yeah because maybe i'm washing the dishes or something when she gets here and it's like if the hug is not immediate it's yeah she i'll just i'll just i, I get the her. look yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, but it's nice to be able to ask those people for that in your life and these people may be friends. They may not actually be part of your your family, um, but it, creating a, an environment and other people that are really there for you and really love you and want to support you is just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to want you to talk a little bit about this idea of being like the super girlfriend or the super parent or you know, super friend or whatever. Um, Which because we've gone over in another episode. We have, but I want to just focus on a little bit of here yeah. because I, I think if we can go into it a little bit more depth, people will get where they're trying to do that yeah. or where they're asking somebody else to do that. Mm -hmm. So can yeah. you talk about that a little bit, about how you discovered like that part of yourself? Yeah, it's it comes from like a fixer kind of mentality or, or a rescuer sort of uh, identity need that you want to be met where you are recognized and valued for being there and uh so if you're someone who maybe doesn't feel like you're worth a whole lot or if you're not very worthy or if people don't really want you around but you you're always there when someone needs you that is coming from a place of you're trying to get your identity need met through all, the one that's always going to be there no matter what. However, that does come at a cost to you because you can't maintain that indefinitely. And I have tried to do that personally for um, people in my life and it does not work out. Um, it becomes too much of a toll because you're taking on all of their stuff and you're trying to solve everything for them and help them work through everything or trying to be there whenever they need you, even if it's at four o'clock in the freaking morning, like you wanna be there and you're gonna drop everything else to be, to um, like be there for that person and try to be everything for them and take care of them. And what that ends up doing is then like you're not necessarily creating an equal partnership there. It's not an equal relationship. You're basically on one knee in front of them, offering everything, being like, "Let me, let me hold everything for you. Your your burdens will be on my shoulders. I shall carry them for you." Um, and saying it like that, it just seems like a little like you know, cuckoo for cocoa puffs, um, because that means you need to look inside yourself to figure out why it is you're wanting to shoulder everyone else's burdens. 
Is it because you don't want to deal with your own or is it because you think if you were to open up about your burdens that no one would love you? Um, is it, for me, that's kind of where it was coming from is I was, wasn't self-aware of my own worth. Like I wasn't aware, uh, aware of my own worth and that I was worthy of love. So I tried to do everything I possibly could that would make sure people would love me and would appreciate me and want me around. And I wanted to be the super, like super friend, the super person that was in their life where they knew like they could always count on, count on me. And if they knew they could always count on me, then why would they want to get rid of me? And, but then it comes to the point where if you're always expected for other people to count on you, like, how are you going to count on yourself? Because you're focusing on everyone else's shit <laughs> when you have time for your own. And that became a struggle. And it was a struggle for me. And I had to really look at, I am not taking care of myself at all by trying to do everything else for everyone else and trying to be there and just support it, be compassionate and kind and empathetic all the time. So I'm just expending all of this energy to try and take care of all of these other people. And it just doesn't work. It doesn't, you don't have enough energy to take care of yourself then. And then you're gonna feel empty afterwards, depleted. And when you want to disappear in a nook and corner, you, you start to resent the fact that you don't have enough energy when people are calling on you because they, that's what they expect you to just come rushing to their aid whenever they call. Well, and you have to really look at, are you really helping that person mm -hmm. by doing that? I mean, remember when you were in college and there were people who couldn't even manage how to call their doctor and um, yeah. ask a question. And you've been doing that for several years mm -hmm. when, by the time you got to college. Yeah. So you were really very comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean you liked making phone calls or anything. A lot no, of people don't, don't like doing that. But she was totally in charge of her own health care by that point. And we did a lot of conversation about things to ask a doctor, mm -hmm. ways to ask a doctor, how to listen to a doctor, all those kinds of things. But a lot of people she went to college with, their parents hadn't had that conversation. The parents were still being super parent and taking care of everything. Yeah. And, and we see that a lot with kids who go to college, uh, not being able to take care of themselves and not being able to make good decisions. They have no basic life skills. Like that's one of the biggest things that I noticed when going to college was that so many people like had zero basic life skills um, for, you know, saving money when like how to, uh, you know, make conscious, you know, spending decisions, how to uh, cook. Uh, the, uh, how to clean things, um, you know, making calls to ask questions about related to something with, at school or, you know, healthcare. Of J they just had no darn clue about how to go about like adult life, basically. And it was very strange to me to kind of you, you have a handle on more of those things. I mean, I wasn't perfect at it, you know, at like 19. Um, but uh, I at least had an understanding of like the best course of action. But the some of my friends just didn't. And some people that I knew just like did not necessarily have that understanding, that um, knowledge to be able to actually make really conscious and smart decisions. So they would get into some sticky situations. Well, a lot of that was because they weren't given increasing levels of responsibility as mm -hmm. they were growing up as teenagers. And some parents um, become helicopter parents and they are so involved in every decision their child makes and there's never a consequence for their action. And you have to really look if, as if you're a parent, what you're doing in that situation. And um, as, as I'm getting older now, it's funny because I'm looking at things like um, it, it would be so much easier to ask Sarah to do lots of things for me. I was like, well, I'm, you know, I'm getting older. There's like nothing wrong with asking for help. And I thought, what if I decided to be as an independent for as long as I could with everything? Uh, and there are certain things I don't do. I, I don't get up on a ladder by myself. Uh, I'll still get up on the ladder, but I make sure somebody's here. Um, I don't get up and, and stress for something so far up that I have a chance of falling. Because, um, you know, for those of us who live alone, falling and nobody noticing is one of our biggest fears. And so, you know, I've looked at it from the opposite direction, too, of like, I don't, I want to continue empowering myself the same way I empowered her to make her own decisions and to take care of herself. And um, also feeling like I, as my, she's one of my primary support people and I for her, you know, are, there are times when I do ask for her help. 
there are times when I'm having a party and I need help getting my house clean and, and she's happy to do it. And, and I, I try to pick the, the ones, the parts of the house cleaning things that she really likes and it, and it works out really well. So I'm not afraid to ask for help, but I've really learned not to be dependent also. And I think that's um, something we all have to look at in our relationships if, is if we are positioning ourselves in such a way to be there, be all, end all, what's our motivation and what's the benefit to the other person? So for the other person, for you to do everything for them, it seems like it's a really good deal in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, and you're just sacrificing and doing and doing and doing. And the detriment to you is to yourself when you're in that position is not having a clear sense of whether you're giving with a, a pure heart. Are you giving to give mm -hmm. or are you giving because you think you're going to get something out of it? And if your identity needs, as Sarah said, are being met by who you are to that person or those persons. And for a lot of women, particularly, our identity needs are all wrapped up in what other people think of us and how well we take care of everybody in our life. And mm -hmm. that's the part that, you know, men are not often evaluated on how well they take care of everyone in their lives. Um, but women are often evaluated on, are they the friend that you can count on? Are they the uh, sister that will show up for you no matter what night and day? Are they the parent who is um, uh, just like relentless about doing everything? You know, they volunteer for every single thing at the school. They rescue you every single time you make a mistake. They bail you out when you make big mistakes uh, constantly. Like, so if you're that person doing the bailing out, what are you getting out of that? If you're the person receiving it and taking advantage of it, what are you resisting in terms of who you're supposed to be in the world? What are you resisting in terms of growing up and having control over your life? You know, and I, I think with her as a teenager, I wanted her to have increasing senses of responsibility, uh, to wake herself up for school, to uh, master assignments. That did not mean I left her alone um, to figure it all out. So every year was like, okay, what, what's a different kind of plan or thing we could organize that would work for you to be able to get things uh, in, done in a timely way? And so we would always work on that. Now, how can I be helpful? Not trying to fix it, but how could I be helpful? Could I ask you about this on certain days? Could I review it? Do you want me to you know, read things? What would you like? And uh, it really created her with a, a much stronger sense of independence. Um, I am not the kind of parent that lets my child fall flat on their face um, and get into serious trouble. I will talk to her about finances. I will talk to her about um, social responsibility in terms of how she handles herself in her relationships. I'll talk to her about anything and honor the fact that at 24, it's, it's on her to make her decisions. Yeah. I don't have to like them, um, but I, uh, I feel like as much as I can, uh, and I'm invited to, I'm willing to share my thoughts and concerns. That's mm -hmm. what we do with each other. Yeah. And um, and she does not try to rescue me. She doesn't try to come in and, and rearrange my cabinets and and uh, complain about things that are, are not clean. If, the, if she notices something's not clean and I haven't noticed that she just takes care of it. And that, that's actually a nice thing. Um, she does let me know so that I can pay attention to it in the future. But it's a, it's a nice balance, and, and I don't feel like I'm overly taken care of, and I don't feel abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the piece, I think, in our relationships. We want to be able to show up in uh, a way that is um, mutually meeting each other's needs. Yeah. And um, that's the part that is tricky sometimes, because sometimes we don't know why we're doing the things we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so I, I remember that one time with a, a partner where you said, I realized I was being super girlfriend all the time. And I, I was so interested in that awareness in her, you know, that she could actually notice where she was trying to step in and, and be the helper and be able to say to the boyfriend, I don't want to do this this way. I'm happy to be the super girlfriend some of the time, but I want to just be regular girlfriend a lot of the time. And so how do we navigate our relationship so yeah. that I, I, I'm not feeling like I need to do that? And his response was really great. He yeah. heard it and responded to it and, and it was great. Yeah. Like yeah. he was, he was like, yeah, I don't want you to be the super girlfriend. <laughs> you can be regular girlfriend. That's fine. You just be girlfriend. That's totally cool with me. So, well, and, and in some relationships, when you try to like move back from where you've been, the super parent or whatever, you're going to have some pushback. People like things the way they are. They yeah. like to be taken care of. They like to be um, shopped for, cooked for, cleaned for, all of those things. 
I am stunned by the number of people that I've seen with their kids moving, their adult kids moving back during um, COVID quarantine who have to stop a conference call. They have to get up and go make their 22 year old son's lunch. I'm like, no. Well, you know, my sandwiches just taste better. I'm like, well, that's great, but we are trying to do a business here. Like, uh, you know, you, you, there, there are some things that don't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I love taking care of her. I love doing things for her. I love buying her surprise presents or picking up something at the grocery store I think she would like. Um, I love doing all of those things, but I don't want to do any of them to the extent that she feels like she's not the independent, um, self-sufficient young woman that she is. And I also want her to feel like uh, she can hold her own in relationships, ask for what she wants, understand where she's being triggered, and um, in general, find the support network that will help her continue to become the adult that she wants to be in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's key. <laughs> So in terms of um, super friends and super parents and, and all those kinds of things, what other advice would you give someone who's trying to extricate themselves from being that person? I think, so first and foremost, if you're going to communicate that, you always want to come from a place of kindness and compassion. So you have to process why you might have been doing that in the first place and what made you possibly want to do that in the first place so that you can talk to the person and, and say, you know, um, like I love you and I care about you deeply and I, and I want to be there for you, but I, my capacity for being able to handle like whatever in my situation, it was like a lot of, uh, drama was happening within the family. And so it was like a, there was a lot of drama that was going on and, you know, I wanted to be there to work and work through it and stuff like that. But it just got to the point where it's just, it's taking too much of my energy to um, hold that space uh, and try to work through it all when it, and so for that, in that situation, it was just, I don't have the capacity to keep doing this. Um, I want to be there for you, but I can't be there for you uh, every second of every day to help you work through some stuff. Like I just, I don't have the capacity. I also need time for myself. So, um, like capacity is a really key thing in that, uh, like be honest about it. Like, you know, I'm running out of spoons, man. Like I don't got enough spoons for myself. I need some spoons for myself. And, um, but it, coming out of a way of like, you still want to be there. You still love them. You still care about them. This isn't to say that you're just gonna, like every time they ask for a question, you're just gonna be like, no, I don't wanna hear it. It's more of like, we need a little bit more communication about um what it is that you want from me if they're if they're asking for advice like asking whether or not they really want for advice or if they just want support if they just want uh you to tell them that man that sucks dude um something like that where there's a more clarity on what they're really coming to you with so that you can conserve your own energy yeah and one of the things i want to say related to that is um well, I think I probably want to say a couple things, but one of them is um, it's not to say that there aren't times when someone needs more help and more attention and for mm -hmm. you to be that super friend or parent or, or whatever. Certainly there are times when that's true. And I think that when we're looking at the responsibility of each person to make those choices, we have to really look at what each of us are getting out of it and what we really need. And so that balance is very hard to attain. I, and I am not a person that believes in balance. Um, I, I, I think that sometimes you have more of one thing and more of another thing at other times. Um, but I, I think that when you're looking at the way that you show up in those ways, it's super important for you to look at what, what's motivating you to do it. So why are you being there all the time for everybody? Are you avoiding something? Are, are you... Uh, wanting to be seen as the ultimate fixer do you are you avoiding intimacy um, you know because if you're in the position of always being the fixer and the person everybody looks to uh, there's not real intimacy there um, there's you as the caregiver mm -hmm. and then the other person who's the receiver and so you know to have more equal relationships requires you to be able to receive 
And so that's one of the dangers of that super friend, super parent, super sibling, whatever it is, mm -hmm. is that you don't allow that other person to give to you. And so you don't have a truly equal partnership. Now, if you're a parent parenting a six-year-old, you're not supposed to have an equal partnership. At the same time, your six-year-old needs to understand mm -hmm. that you need to be kind and compassionate to you and to other people. One of the things we've talked about a couple times on our episodes, I think, is the number of people we've seen who allow their young children to treat them like crap. And I don't understand that. I don't think that does anything for the child, and it certainly doesn't do anything for the parents I've seen. I've, in fact, I've seen it be pretty damaging to parents who allow that. And I'm, I don't really know where they got that. I don't know how that became a trend. But in certain demographics, we've really seen that uh, strategy that people have used where they let the kid just say and do whatever they want and, and let themselves be abused. And so teaching our children from a very young age that kindness and compassion rules uh, is, is a really smart thing and to take care of themselves, but to also be generous and giving. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really want you to think about the places in your life where you are showing up as the super whatever, fill in the blank, or you're the receiver of that from someone in your life. And so when you look at that, is that an appropriate relationship? There are certain people I have in my life uh, who are body workers, caregivers, and I often have a, another kind of friendship with them, but often it's not a totally equal one. I know some people do that, but I wanna feel like, I don't wanna know the inner workings of the people that I let into my uh, inner workings who are like working on my body. I don't wanna know everything about them usually. I don't mind knowing a little bit, um, but people that I'm going to let in with that kind of intimacy with, and I'm not talking about just getting a massage, I'm talking about really much deeper body work. I need them to be a little separate from me and to feel like I, um, I am there because I'm paying them mm -hmm. um, for something. Yeah. And so that's totally different than I feel with my friends uh, or other people in my life, family, whatever. Uh, it's very different than what I feel in terms of my relationship. Now, in some of my family and friend relationships, I do have my life a little more together. And so I can be a little bit more available, but I really have to look at if I'm doing the giving all the time, why is that? Yeah. You know, what is it that I'm getting out of it? And what is it that, um, that's helping them or what is it that's hurting them? Because it's not, it's not in their best interest for me to always be showing up as the rescuer. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things we wanted to also talk about is about finding different people to go to for different things. Yes. And so um, your primary romantic relationship, a lot of us make this mistake of thinking that our primary relationship is going to be all things. And there is just no way that that can be true. And you can divide those things up any way you want. I mean, you can go to this person who's your hiking buddy, this person who you can tell everything to, uh, this person that you like to play cards with. Um, but you know, to expect anybody to be all things just makes no sense. And so being able to look at what's missing for you, like if you're unhappy in a relationship, a friendship or a uh, primary romantic relationship, when you look at that, are there places where you're expecting that person to be more than who they are? Are you expecting them to, to be more than who they have the capacity to be? Uh, are you expecting them to show up and want to do things that they really just don't like? I remember talking to some friends once after we had done a zip lining thing and I was talking to these friends and I, was, I said, we should go do this. And, and one of them went along with it for a little while and, until they finally said, I'll never do that. I'm, I'm too afraid of heights. I was like, why were you talking about making plans? And, but they, they were one of those people that likes the people's approval. So they didn't want anybody to disapprove of them. But as it got more real as the idea that we might go do something like this, they finally had to say, I, that's, that's not me. It's like, great, okay. I mean, yeah. I have other friends I can do those kinds of things with, but I love adventures with my friends. Yeah. And so I really like to um, find people that want to do some kind of adventure. And I like lots of different kinds of adventures. And so it really helps to be able to think about, okay, these are the friends I do this kind of thing with. These are the friends I'll do a one-on-one -on -one, uh, kind of visit with, but these people I only like to see when I'm in a group. Um, sometimes they are people that suck the life out of me. They, they have too much energy need. They're like energy vampires. And I don't mind them being around. I don't want to be exclusive and feel like they can't be in my sphere. But they take way too much energy away from me in ways that uh, I have not ever been able to figure out how to manage. And so when I have those people, 
I kind of joke about putting them in the stable over here. And it's like, they get to come out and play when we have a, a bigger group. But for the one-on-one -on -one stuff, I want people who are, aren't going to monopolize the conversation, mm -hmm. aren't going to suck the energy out of me, aren't going to be full of drama all the time. Um, so I, 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 I like being there for those people when it's needed. I just don't want to be have my relationships be the ones where the um, the person's always taking because there I had a long history of being the giver and I, I finally saw what I was getting out of that and and people um, I have friends who are therapists who pointed it out to me early on and I I got it cognitively but I didn't quite get it enough to be able to make the changes and so to be able to look at who I am and to embrace who I am that I don't have to do or be anything has been really uh, energizing for me. And to be able to just realize that who I am is enough. I don't, yeah. it doesn't matter how much I do, uh, how much I listen. Um, I, I'm not getting graded on that in this life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it's, it's important to know your own worth and like to love yourself and be able again and to, uh, feel your your own power so that you're not having to feel like you have to beg someone for that validation. You can validate yourself. Um, we, not to say that, you know, we enjoy, I enjoy external validation. I like when people tell me, you know, I appreciate you and thank you for being my friend. But I also do that with the people in my life too. Like, I'd like to just randomly say I think thank you for uh, being so and so to me I really appreciate it you're great I love you um it's really sweet almost once a day she'll say mommy I go yes <laughs> thank you for being my mom and it's like and every time I was like I like you I like it it's the greatest job I've ever had yeah I I like to tell people that I appreciate them and I don't necessarily expect that in return but with the people in my life when I say thank you for being my friend everyone's like thank you for being my friend, you know? And like, that's that's the kind of relationships that I want where you can both appreciate what you have in the relationship so that um, you, it, it's a sense of, it, where you're on the same gro ground, like you're on the same level. It's this equilibrium that you've been able to, to find because it's just, it's really draining when you just have to give all the time, when someone expects you to give all the time. So, because that's what some people can fall into once you've created a pattern, they expect that, and then it's harder for you to get out of it. Um, which is why it's, at this point, like I've learned that I want to go to different people for different things, and I've worked that out in my relationships. Like it wasn't just immediately, oh, this is what I do with this person, this is what I do with this person, this is what I do with this person. I have to, you have to get to know everyone in your life to be able to be, to kind of test things out, to realize like, oh, this person is really great for, a, you know, chilling, but also having some super deep conversations about what's going on in the world and stuff like that. Because maybe you see, uh, you come at things from a similar similar way, so you're able to hear it differently if they're offering advice or something like that. Um, while other people um, might have a more uh, uh, critical view on things, and so if they try uh, telling you things or offering advice, you may not hear it as well, or you take it a little personally. So maybe that's not a person you go to advice for advice. Um, so it's just finding a balance of where you, what you can ask for from your friends so that you're not asking for, for more than they can give you, um, or for more, uh, or asking them for things that you don't receive well. Uh, because sometimes you can get a little prickly when you, you, they do something and it's not really what you wanted. So if it's not what you wanted, but you have a friend that does what you want, why not go to that friend for that thing, right? So yeah. it's finding a balance and finding where you, both of you can thrive together in that relationship. That's the important thing is that there's a sense of you're both thriving and you're both happy instead of a feeling of like too many expectations or neither of you are happy or getting what you really want. So it's what are you... What do you need from that relationship and what works best in that relationship for getting your needs met? 
Yeah, I, I, I'm reminded of two things as you're talking about that. One is that I remember hearing Elizabeth Gilbert, the author, speak at your college uh, a mm -hmm. couple of years ago. And one of the things that she was, was saying was uh, in relation to people being critical of her work or reviews or whatever. So I did the best I could the first time. I don't really care about their um, interpretation of, of it later. And so one of the things that she said was that one of her friends would say, can I be brutally honest with you? And she would say yes for a long time. And finally she started saying no, mm -hmm. because the key word was brutal. Yeah. And it's like, you have to look at the people who they get their needs met by being brutally honest. Uh, and and I, I look at the, the kinds of people that you know we've talked about, about um, that they need certain things. And when you don't provide those needs anymore for them, you don't, uh, you don't solve that problem, they go elsewhere. Yeah. They don't want to be your friend anymore. And mm -hmm. that's been really eye-opening to me. The people that uh, they know what they want, they know what they need, and if I don't give it to them, um, they're not open to a different way of learning to relate. They just go find it somewhere else. That, and that's cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm really a big proponent of us finding the people that, you know, they like our weirdness. We like their weirdness. Oh, and we, yeah. We're weird together. And we have fun. Uh -huh. um, that's important. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that some parents, you need to look at how enmeshed you are with your children, mm. um, both your growing up children and your adult children. You know, where are you still doing way too much for them? Or way are, where are you trying to get all your needs met from that child? Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that is the thing I've heard be really damaging for a lot of people when a, a parent has uh, lived through their child way too much. And um, it's important for your child to learn to separate and do their own thing. And, and I'm not, a, I, I've said this many times, I'm not the let your child fall flat on the, your, their face kind of person. Um, but I do believe in giving them a little space and so that they can uh, test some other things out, learn some other things from other people, and keeping an open line of communication so you can have a conversation about it. Yeah. You know, and being able to ask them questions. You know, I heard this happen at, at school today. I was talking to one of the other moms and I heard this happen. How, what did you think about that? How did you experience it? And, and don't ask them yes or no questions. That, that's a big danger. But ask them a question that, that's going to have them be thoughtful. Maybe they didn't even notice what happened. Maybe it was somebody got bullied and they were just in their own world that that's how they protect themselves. Um, a friend of mine's 20-year-old um, son recently died in his sleep. And she said in the course of uh, talking with his friends and, all, and um, processing the grief, she found out that he'd been really bullied early on in his uh, grade school time. And she didn't know it. And so it was just this interesting uh, awareness of the things that our kids don't necessarily tell us. And so being able to ask certain questions like, wow, what would it feel like for you if somebody was treating you that way? And um, how do you think you could protect yourself if somebody was being mean to you all the time or stealing things from you? Or have you noticed anything happening at school where somebody feels like they're being singled out and uh, being made to feel different? And what would that be like if it happened to you? Has that ever happened to you? And really engaging in more conversation. What is um, really scary to me is uh, I used to run Girl Scout weekends and camps and all that sort of thing. And I remember we were doing a uh, series of weekends and we realized that the adults in many cases didn't know how to have a conversation with a table full of kids. That a lot of families don't eat at the table together anymore or if they're eating at a table, they all have their electronic devices out or they're reading or whatever, that we've, in many families, lost the art of conversation around the mm -hmm. dinner table. And we're together a lot. Yeah. And so sometimes we do pull out our phones at meals or, or whatever. But or we'll eat and watch a TV show right. or a movie or something like but, that. But it's because we spend a lot of time talking to each other, and, and so that works for us. But in times when that wasn't true, like I would be working full time and she was working full time or going to school or whatever, we would make sure to have that time to have that connection. But, you know, I, I really invite you to do some examination of uh, where you are with that with your child, um, where you are with that with an elderly parent. Um, you know, how enmeshed are you in somebody else's decisions and um, the, how attached are you to the outcome? Yeah. And that's the really big thing for me is, am I attached to the outcome with this person in this friendship? Mm -hmm. So if, if the outcome of this friendship is we're only going to be friends if I do, 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 do for them, am I willing to let go of that friendship? And I, in, in uh, the course of doing some work this year, I had to really look at the places in my life and the people in my life 
who made me feel really expanded and really good mm -hmm. and the people who made me feel contracted and fearful and anxious and I had to spend less time with the people who made me feel anxious and more time with the people who I felt the sense of calm and expansion with mm -hmm. and again it doesn't mean I abandoned those other people it just meant I I had to modify the way I related to them so that yeah. I could feel better yeah the important thing yeah, yeah. So our final point is we just want to talk about surrounding yourself with love. What would it be like in your life if you surrounded yourself with more love, freely given mm -hmm. and freely received? For many of you, your muscle of receiving is pretty weak. And for many of you, your muscle of giving is way overdeveloped. And so to be able to look at your relationship with your parents, with your children, with your siblings, with your friends, with your spouse, where are the places where you're letting love in, where you're giving love, where you're feeling compassion and kindness in your life, where you're feeling expansion? And where are the places where you feel stuck and unappreciated and just not where you want to be? Mm -hmm. There's a feeling inside your body that lets you know that you're just not happy with where things are. And I know a lot of women have gotten to a certain place in their lives, um, especially women who have altered career paths, uh, not necessarily given up a career, but altered career paths and to make sure they had enough time for their for their family, who wake up one day and it's like, well, wait, is this all there is? Like, I, I, mm -hmm. I want more. I want more romance with my spouse or I want um, more friendships with other people. Am, am I, did I overdo the balance? Uh, and did I do way more for other people than I needed to do? Any other closing thoughts? <laughs> like, I think the other thing too, just to briefly talk about is that a lot of people, it, like within relationships with expectations, people's love can feel very conditional. And that can get you into a feeling, can cause the feeling of you're not worthy of love that you're not uh, valued as a person because you have to do certain things. You got to fit in a certain box to conform to what they want. Um, and then they'll love you and they'll give you love. And I don't think that that's like, that's not a place of expansion. You know, that's not a, allowing you to really be who you are. And so if you feel like you have to fit inside a box for someone to love you, my advice would GTFO. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's to consider why you're pretzeling yourself into this tiny little box to make this person, to make, this, this was in, make is in quotes, um, make this person love you. Um, or why are you doing that for this person's love? What are you, what are you really getting out of that? Because uh, we've had a really long talk a while ago about unconditional love versus conditional. And something that we, that we discussed was that her love for me is unconditional. Um, and not to say that like, she's going to put up with me being an asshole, um, no. <laughs> or something like that, but to say that like, you know, I'm allowed, I'm allowed to make mistakes. Things happen. I can upset her, but that doesn't mean her love is just going to go away. She is going to continue to love me and loving people is a choice. You don't just really fall out of love or you, you can choose to keep making the effort to change things so that you can still be there in that feeling um, or you let it go and so for like unconditional love that's what I feel towards my friends too is like they can do things that upset me but it's okay because I can go to them and I can talk to them about it be like this really upset me and we can talk it out and we move forward because now something we've shifted something again in our relationship and we're both determined and committed to continuing forward within it and so I think for wanting to be the super person, that's a really big thing is, are you being the super person because you're trying to fit in all the boxes that they want that, um, or the box that they want you to fit in so you can receive love? Because if they really like, why would you want to contort yourself when there's someone else out there that may fully love you for all of who you are, that you can just show up and they're like, 
this is magnificent. I love all of this. Um, you know, inside and out, like, like that is such a beautiful feeling to be fully and truly accepted and fully and truly loved for all of who you are inside and out. And like, if you're not feeling that in your relationship, really look at your relationship. And it's not to say, you know, <laughs> I jokingly say GTFO, but like really look at, um, what's going on in that relationship and how you can maybe um, uh, talk to them about it or remove yourself so that there's not so much pressure to fit in that little box that they they created for you and just handed them like, if you fit in this, I'll love you. Um, and said, embrace who you are. And like, once you embrace who you are, people will come to you and be like, dude, you're dope. <laughs> like, you're awesome. Can we be friends? Like. Why don't, can we get together? Can we hang out? Can we get to know each other? Because they want to know you and they want to, and they accept you and want to love you for all of who you are. Um, so that's, that's been something that I've had to learn. It's just really like not accepting conditional love because conditional love does not make you feel good. Conditional love makes you contract because you're having to fit into a, a space that doesn't fit you. It's like trying to shove a square, like the, you know, the baby puzzles with the little like shapes and the holes in the box or something, you gotta put the shapes through. It's like you're trying to shove a square through a triangle hole. Like that doesn't work. You have to find the triangle hole, of the triangle shape to put through the triangle hole, right? So life be, if you're square, why not find a someone who has a square hole that you can fit through? Because they're like, you're really cool and you're amazing instead of someone trying to force you to be a triangle. Yeah, I think we're, many times we're so afraid to be alone that mm -hmm. we um, uh, tolerate things that really don't make us happy. And so I encourage you as you look around at your support network to look at who the people are that make you feel really expansive and really good and really happy in your life and spend more time with those people and find more of those people. Mm -hmm. And the other people who make you feel small and unappreciated, if there's some of those people or people you have to spend time with, then you've got to change the way you relate to them. You do yeah. not have to be the super parent, the super daughter. Yeah. Um, you have to change the way you relate to them and the way you allow their energy to affect you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that last thing you brought up is so important as, as we are often raised in a way that um, is conditional love. Yeah. And so to be able to really learn what unconditional love is, and um, it doesn't mean you always like the actions of the other person, but no. to love them enough to compassionately and kindly express your feelings um, after you've looked at whatever the triggers are for yeah. you. Um, and um, and work together to have a better relationship mm -hmm. or to, to decide maybe this isn't the right friendship. Yeah. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with deciding that there are people in your life that, that just don't fit. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's actually healthy. And so looking for yourself at who you have in your support network, who you can go to for different things that you need in your life. Mm -hmm. um, and then look at yourself. I mean, don't be afraid to look at yourself and say, okay, where am I showing up as needy, dependent? Where am mm -hmm. I showing up as being the super person? You know, and how do I become a stronger me so that my relationships can be stronger and, yeah. and healthier and happier? And so it, it's a two-way thing. It's about looking at who you've got in your life and, and what they're giving to you and whether you're willing to receive it. Mm -hmm. And then what are you doing and how are you showing up in order to give? Um, and what's the purity of your giving? Are you trying to get something? Or are you giving because it feels good? Mm -hmm. I, I had to look at a few things in my life where I was like, okay, why do you want to do that? Because I can get into a place where I'm feeling super generous and want to give a lot to a lot of people and have a lot of events and have people over and stuff. And I have to go, okay, are you trying to get a need met from that? Or you, do you genuinely want to do X, Y, and Z? And so I, I really I, I really hope you'll take some time to mm -hmm. um, connect with yourself and just go to that place we've talked about in our other episode on inner peace and really look at what what works for you what makes you happy yeah and and um especially during these times like what can you do to do more of what makes you happy yeah 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 good complete yeah double thumbs up awesome <laughs> we love you we can't wait to be with you again until then take care